This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. You've made it through your Monday and I hear this show is best enjoyed with a beverage, adult or otherwise. Don't ask me how I know that. It's supposed to be a lifeline for small businesses trying to survive the pandemic. Instead, a newsy investigation found government loan programs cutting checks for far less aid than originally promised. Plus, March Madness means big business for bars and restaurants. We'll tell you how owners are hoping to use the tournament to rebound from the pandemic. But first, here's what you need to know right now. Spring break is in full swing down in Florida. Over the weekend, there were more than 50 arrests, several fights, gunfire, and property damage near Miami Beach. <laughs> Officials imposed an emergency curfew starting at 8 p.m. every Thursday night through Monday morning to try and deal with the crowds. As of now, that curfew is scheduled to last until mid-April. The governor has said, you know, everything's open, come on down. But the problem is that we're still in the, mix, in the midst of a pandemic. It's not in a rear view mirror yet by any means, and it's certainly not in my county and my city. But it's not just Florida. For the last 11 days, TSA screened more than 1 million passengers daily. That's the highest numbers we've seen in air travel since the pandemic began last year. That, along with spring break partying and states reopening, has health experts concerned about another wave of coronavirus infections. And another thing that's got health experts worried, the more transmissible UK variant, which is expected to be the more dominant strain of COVID in the US by the end of March. We are a critical point in this pandemic, a fork in the road where we as a country must decide which path we are going to take. We must act now, and I am worried that if we don't take the right actions now, we will have another avoidable surge. Right now, much of Europe is putting restrictions back in place after dealing with the surge of cases brought on by the UK variant. The results are in, and according to a U.S. trial, the AstraZeneca vaccine is 79% effective in preventing symptomatic cases of COVID. It was also found to be 100% effective against severe cases requiring hospitalizations. The trial involved more than 32,000 people. Despite concerns of blood clots that made headlines last week, the independent review found no safety concerns with the shot. AstraZeneca is now preparing to apply for emergency use authorization, but the U.S may not need the vaccine. The shot would likely not be granted EUA until May, and federal officials predict that by then, there will already be enough doses of the other three vaccines approved. Still, the results of this trial could help boost confidence of the vaccine in Europe. Last week, at least a dozen countries pause administration of the shot to look into some possible rare side effects. After reviewing the vaccine, Europe's drug regulator also found it to be safe and effective. Most countries have now resumed giving the shot. New documents revealed more than 800 unaccompanied minors have been in the Border Patrol's custody for more than 10 days. Legally, the agency is only allowed to house kids in those facilities for up to 72 hours. Right now, the Biden administration is working to get those kids into shelters run by the Department of Health and Human Services. This is happening as the number of children in custody continues to rise almost every day. Immigration patterns tend to be cyclical, according to experts. Historically, the U.S. has seen a rise in migrants seeking asylum during springtime, but according to Homeland Security, this surge could become the biggest in two decades. Critics of the president say this surge is happening in part because the Biden administration made policy changes without making it clear to migrants they should not be traveling to the border. Over the weekend, the Secretary of Homeland Security announced the Biden administration was closing the southern border and sending back families and adults, but said they would not turn back kids. We uh, will not uh, abandon our values and our principles. We will not abandon the needs of vulnerable children. That is what this is all about. We are executing uh, on our plan. It does take time. It is difficult. A new leader took charge of the Small Business Administration today, and one of her first decisions will be what to do about the billions of dollars in pandemic relief not getting out the door. As Newsy's Patrick Terpster discovered, Struggling small businesses are unable to get more aid, even though there's plenty of money to spare. Beer stopped flowing at Atlas Brew Works in Washington when the pandemic hit. Our business fell by more than half, almost overnight. Closed during lockdown, then partially reopened with indoor dining restrictions. For his brewery to survive, Justin Cox needed cash 
and traditional loans weren't an option. Banks just stopped making loans, especially to people in kind of the food and beverage industry. So he went to the federal government, the Small Business Administration, for what's known as an economic injury disaster loan. But he was disappointed to learn, unlike other disasters where you could borrow up to $2 million, the SBA last April cut off COVID-19 loans at $150,000. That's all from this program he could get. So it certainly was not nearly enough and for our business and a lot of other small businesses, um, but something is, is better than nothing. We found Atlas was not the only business to max out at a $150,000 loan. Our data team sifted through records from the SBA and discovered 567,000 businesses nationwide were like Atlas, maxing out at that $150,000 loan limit, all unable to borrow a penny more from that lifeline. Why has the SBA uh, placed that $150,000 borrowing limit? The SBA administrator at the time under President Trump told senators the cap was necessary to fan out loans quickly to as many places as possible. We had uh, over 5 million applications in the queue. Yet now we've confirmed the program is running a massive surplus, $271 billion unspent and not lent. And that was before Congress injected another $15 billion from the new stimulus law. Raise your right hand. The SBA, with a brand new administrator, is currently re-examining the $150,000 loan maximum. A decision on whether to lift the cap has been made, the SBA tells us, with an announcement coming before the end of the month. This is our brewery. Atlas also received funds from the SBA's Paycheck Protection Program, but could still use a bigger disaster loan. If the SBA was to expand the program, we absolutely would go back, back to them. Money to buy more aluminum to can his beer and to staff up ahead of what he hopes will be a full reopening. I'm feeling optimistic, but we're still not there. And recovery. Patrick Terps, Renuzzi, Washington. You know the term March Madness dates back to 1939? I would love to go back in time and be like, y'all have no idea how much I've been tormented by this every year. March Madness is taking up most people's mental capacity right now. Maybe even mine. So we decided to dig into some trending topics from the first weekend of the NCAA tournament. Here's what we got. There's at least one every tournament. The opening round of this year's men's tournament belonged to number 15, Oral Roberts. They took down number seven, University of Florida, 81 to 78. And yes, I too had to look up exactly where Oral Roberts is located. It's in Tulsa. The Oral Roberts Golden Eagles are only the second number 15 seed to reach the Sweet 16. And they weren't the only upsets on Sunday. Loyola, Syracuse, and Oregon State all took down their higher seeded opponents. The NCAA tracked more than 20 million online brackets through five major online bracket challenges. And you'll be happy to know everybody's bracket sucks. Now we can all commiserate together as chaos reigns. Oregon's men's team moved forward in the tournament over the weekend without playing a single minute after their match with VCU was called a no contest because of COVID protocols. VCU reportedly had multiple positive tests within a 48 hour period. They were the first team forced out of the tournament due to COVID, but definitely not the only squad to be affected by the pandemic throughout the season. Duke, Kansas, and Virginia, teams that are typically fun to watch during March Madness, were forced out of their conference tournaments because of COVID. And let's not forget the whole damn NCAA tournament is being played in Indiana because of this pandemic. The tournament wraps up April 5th. The NCAA president has said that more cases could crop up by then, but the goal is to avoid serious medical issues throughout, like COVID, right? The NCAA basically said, my bad, and is vowing to do better after being called out for supplying the women's basketball teams with subpar exercise equipment. This is our weight room. Let me show y'all the men's weight room. The implication that some of the best college athletes in the world would be fine with dumbbells and yoga mats during the biggest basketball tournament of the season is a little boneheaded at the very least. Several professional athletes went off on the NCAA on social media calling the disparities between men's and women's equipment disrespectful. The NCAA apologized, saying it would never happen again. Meanwhile, the women's teams got an overdue upgrade to their weight room. We'll let Sedona Prince give us an update.
We got a bunch of bands. Look at this, guys. And we got some equipment. Ayo, hey, thank you, NCAA, for listening to us. We appreciate y'all. Thank you so much for real. March Madness usually brings with it an economic boom to local businesses. And this year, bars and restaurants are welcoming the tournament after a year of financial hurdles brought on by the pandemic. Newsy's Meg Hilling has more. College basketball fans aren't the only ones cheering as March Madness tournaments get underway. There will be zero room for walk-ins. We're actually pretty full right now. As COVID-19 cases decline, bars say they're excited to welcome NCAA fans safely back to their tables and patios, even if capacity is still partially limited. In previous years, we were worried about capacity because of the fire department, but this, you know, this year we're kind of worried about capacity with the health department. You know, the, there's only so much space we can get people in here. Many bar owners say the return of the tournaments and the fans is a welcome sight after a year of financial hurdles brought on by the pandemic. It's going to be really tough to get back to that old normal, uh, considering that we've experienced a worldwide pandemic. Uh, there's been so many changes in the last year that um, I think, you know, restaurants have, we've had to adapt and evolve. And I think there's some changes that are, uh, you know, in place, possibly for good. But as fans head out to cheer on their alma maters, health officials are still advising caution. Certainly, we're excited because we do have some local teams here that are looking pretty good in terms of the NCAA. But obviously, we are a long way from being past COVID here. And we're really aware that in the second half of March, right at the beginning of April, we're not yet at a point where we can just say, you know, open it up, let's, you know, come, come on out. Bars say they will do everything they can to make sure fans and staff stay safe. I feel good with what we've done as a company um, and just staying right along, you know, steady with what the city's doing. Likely I have to turn some people away um, just right. because we're, we're only at the 50% the uh, capacity. They just need fans to be team players when it comes to social distancing measures. The key is if everyone plays by the rules, I think the more prosperous, uh, you know, restaurants are going to be um, even at even at 50 percent capacity, uh, which is, you know, a, a lot better than 25 percent capacity. It's a lot better than being closed for just delivery and pickups. For Newsy, I'm Meg Hilling. When you're back, we'll tell you how people across the country are responding to attacks on AAPI communities. The rise of attacks against AAPI communities, including the Atlanta area shootings where a gunman killed six women of Asian descent, have prompted a wave of demonstrations focused on anti-Asian sentiment. Newsy's Kat Sandoval tells us more. Across the country, from California to New York, hundreds have marched united against anti-Asian hate. And held vigils to remember the Atlanta shooting victims. The reality is that this could have been me or my sister or my family. Since the start of the pandemic, the Asian American community has been faced with discrimination and attacks and often blamed for the pandemic. What happened in Atlanta has galvanized people. It's hard to go through something like this and just be by yourself. Asian American advocacy groups are calling the shooting by a white male gunman a hate crime because of the eight victims killed. A majority of them were Asian women. He could have gone to any other spot, but he chose the Asian American spas and he chose to kill Asian American workers. FBI Director Christopher Ray says the shootings don't appear to be racially motivated, though the case is still under investigation. There's no hate crime there? You gotta be kidding! And then for the Sheriff's Department office to say the killer had a bad day? The killer had a bad day? Those eight people had bad days. This is outrageous. Senator Tammy Duckworth has asked Ray and Attorney General Merrick Garland to look into whether hate crimes against Asian Americans are underreported. I want to see a deeper investigation into whether or not these shootings and other similar crimes are racially motivated. It looks racially motivated to me. Activists have seen a rise in Asian attacks. Reporting center Stop API Hate recorded nearly 3,800 anti-Asian incidents since the start of the pandemic. 68 of them were women. 
President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, whose mother is from India, met with Asian American leaders in Atlanta days after the shooting. They acknowledged the ongoing surge of violence against Asian Americans and took a stand against racism and xenophobia. A harm against any one of us is a harm against all of us. For Newsy, I'm Kat Sandoval. If you haven't done so already, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. Researchers have found that hashtag to be 100% effective at getting my attention 60% of the time. Here's an update on COVID vaccinations in the U.S. More than 13% of the population is already fully vaccinated, and the rest are on pace to be able to get a shot in the next few months. Good news, right? But the vaccines don't eliminate future threats. They are a tool to help us get through this pandemic. National reporter Elizabeth Ruiz shows us how researchers are already preparing for the next one. The Infectious Disease Research Center at Colorado State University is filled with researchers hard at work trying to better understand the virus that causes COVID-19 and potential vaccine candidates. Dr. Greg Dean is the head of the Department of Microbiology, Immunology and Pathology at the university. We had been working on a coronavirus vaccine for cats prior to the pandemic. And so we were already thinking about coronavirus vaccines and were able to pivot pretty quickly. Their goal, finding a pan-coronavirus vaccine. It's saying, can we uh, create a vaccine that would induce an immune response that could recognize many, many different types of coronaviruses. We've already seen three types, SARS-CoV-1, MERS, and now SARS-CoV-2. Dr. Marcela Hanau Tamayo says history has shown us there will be more. The reason we think coronavirus or a pan-coronavirus vaccine is so important is because we've seen how lethal coronaviruses can be. According to Dr. Hanau Tamayo, it will take a lot of funding and patience. She says the most difficult part for scientists will be predicting which coronaviruses will be the next to jump from animals to humans. What we're looking at with the pan-coronavirus vaccine, though, is to really focus on regions of um, the virus that are less susceptible to mutation and that are similar across the many different coronaviruses that we know about. It should be mentioned none of this story was filmed in the presence of the virus. That's in a separate biohazard lab where the research team can test existing methods for a potential pan-coronavirus vaccine. Dr. Dean has been collaborating with scientists from other universities to develop a vaccine method using some resources that are familiar to humans, even if you don't know them by name. Our research is focused on a particular vaccine platform that utilizes a probiotic uh, called lactobacillus acidophilus. Uh, it's in a lot of different types of food, like yogurt, and it's considered safe. Dr. Dean says the method he's trying to develop could make the vaccine accessible to everyone, including those in developing countries. A trained medical staff wouldn't even be needed. You could just, let's say, drink a pill and that would be your vaccine. That would be awesome. Another vaccine candidate is called Solovax. Ray Goodrich is the executive director of the Infectious Disease Research Center and has been studying the method for decades. You basically kill the virus, you prevent it from being able to replicate but you leave the virus particle intact. That causes the body to recognize the foreign threat and create an immune response. Goodrich says there are many advantages to this vaccine method. They're easy to scale up. Uh, they can, you can use formulations of them uh, that respond to different strains or different variants that come along. The researchers say they already have the information they need to form a pan vaccine. They're just waiting on funding and hoping people understand why it's essential to be thinking to the future. This disease, unfortunately, is going to be more like the flu than it is like polio. It probably is not going to be a situation where you have one vaccination and you're done. Another obstacle, while we work to combat coronavirus, the virus is getting better at surviving. They are just getting much better at infecting us and infecting many of us at the same time. It's just a matter of whether we're ready for the next virus to emerge. With photojournalist Luis Ramirez, I'm Elizabeth Ruiz reporting. 
That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow for more in the loop. Same time, same place. Top stories from news here headed your way right now.